So we're done with scattering. We are now moving to the next level of complications where the particles are moving. No questions? Okay, well. Um, so dynamic light scattering is a very popular and powerful method for studying uh, particles in suspension. And <clears throat> there are many commercial instruments, there are companies that are running on this principle. And the applications are very, very diverse. Uh, there are two classes of applications, if you want. One is characterizing the particles themselves. So, for example, you have a suspension of some kind of protein, for example, and we would like to know the distribution of sizes for those aggregates. It is very hard to measure otherwise in a suspension uh, unless you use this. It's very powerful. Okay, and we'll learn about the principles of that. But there is also a second class of applications, I would say more recent, where actually we implant the beads in a liquid. So we know the particles, but we don't know the liquid or the fluid surrounding the particles. Right? So two classes. One, you know the fluid, you are after the particles. The second, you know the particles, you try to understand the fluid. And it's actually very interesting. The second part of application is, the, the first one is very clear cut. I want to know the size distribution usually. The second part is actually very interesting because it relates to biology. And that is understanding the viscoelastic properties of the fluid that surround the particles. And as you know, cellular material, for example, is not a simple fluid. It's not just a viscous fluid, a liquid. actually has elasticity in it because the cells contain polymers, right? Long, kind of coily molecules that actually are able to store energy, not just dissipate. Okay? So we'll touch very little on that. This is called microreology. If we have time, we'll do more on that. But for now, um, the purpose of this lecture is to understand the connection, so experimentally, um, the connection between the observable, the things we measure, which will be a scattered intensity, to the size of the particles, okay? So what is that connection? So first, I think I mentioned to you earlier, let me clarify something. Um, the problem is exactly the same as we defined it before. I have particles in the medium, except uh, I have an incident, k vector, I define a, an arbitrary uh, system of reference. Each particle has its own coordinate. I'm observing the scatter field somewhere at the point P. This distance is very large with respect to the inter-particle distances, so I can use the far field approximation. And everything is under the Born approximation. So everything is the same as before, except these distances of the coordinates of the particles are varying in time. That's the only difference. So. I think we mentioned before that if we look at uh, this, uh, this little triangle that I like very much with the momentum conservation, Ki, this is really Ks, and this is what we call Q. So Q vector equals Ks minus Ki, oops, Ki. You remember that, right? And when we calculated the length of Q, we ended up with something like 2, 2 pi over lambda, sine of theta over 2, where this will be theta over 2. The whole thing is theta. And we assume here that actually lambda is constant. And this is what we call elastic scattering. You remember that discussion? So this becomes a nice Sussellus triangle, and it's just geometry from fifth grade to, I mean, seventh grade, so you get this. Now, what happens in dynamic light scattering? The particles are moving. Is the k vector, the length of the k vector, is the wavelength of the incident and the scatter field the same? It's Doppler shifted. So, if you interact 
If you have this k incident onto a particle and the particle is moving in a certain direction, v, what scatters off, I don't know, let's say over a certain direction, ks. So the magnitude of ks is 2 pi over lambda, so the wavelength of the scattered field, uh, versus the incident one, which is 2 pi over lambda not, let's say, the original one, or lambda i. Do you know how the Doppler shift works? How, what, what's the difference between these two? If I have k incident this way, and my particle is moving this way, at 90 degrees, do I get a Doppler shift? No. So basically, the Doppler shift delta F, the frequency shift, delta F D, is something like delta K times V. Meaning, uh, delta K is actually our Q. So it's K. K, ah, K is scattered minus K incident, not magnitude, just vectors. K is scattered minus K incident dot V. Okay? So what we said earlier is, what in, is not entirely true. If I measure the scatter field at a certain angle, I will get the Doppler shift. If I measure the scatter field right in back scattering like that, then my Q will be something like this, K scatter minus K incident. That will be zero. Because V, whenever delta K is perpendicular to V, the delta F Doppler is zero. By the way, this has implications for imaging. If you're trying to measure vasculature, which is a typical application for OCT, for example. So you look at the mouse's brain or something like that, and you try to do microscopy, and you're interested to calculate those velocity, velocity distributions. If you send the light this way and you measure in backscattering, which is the typical configuration, you're very, in, very insensitive to these perpendicular velocities for this reason. Okay, so let's get back. Let's not digress too much on this Doppler thing. What I'm trying to tell you here is that this, <coughs> let, uh, this frequency shift is very little compared to the actual velocity of the, uh, to the actual frequency of the optical field. Okay, so how do we write this? So let's say this delta k is of the order of the maximum is 2k naught, right? K incident case, okay. Uh, all right, and then I'm trying to write delta F Doppler divided by F optical. The frequency, the optical frequency, I want to know how big is that compared to a Doppler shift for a particular velocity V. Yeah? So let's do that. So I get, I don't know, 2K naught. V divided by what is the frequency in terms of the speed of light? Huh? Yeah, how do I express the frequency in terms of C? Huh? C over lambda, okay. What's C over lambda? Yeah, and I want it uh, in terms of K naught. K naught C, something like that, right? Do I miss a 2 pi? Over 2 pi? Okay. So, whatever. The point is, is of the order of V over C. The frequency shift introduced by a moving object traveling at velocity v 
the relative change in frequency is ex proportional to the velocity of the object or the speed of the object divided by the speed of light. So even if you have a crazy fast particle, even if the particle is moving at the speed of sound, which would be really high speed, right? So that would be what? Hundreds of meters per second. You divide by 10 to the 8 meters per second, and you don't get all that much. OK? For this reason, it means uh, what we get is that the light, the lambda of the scatter field is really the same as lambda of the incident. Not precisely, but it could be off by, I don't know, if I, my particle is moving at a meter per second, I'll get an error of 10 minus 8. OK? So let's say 10 minus 8 difference. So for this reason, we call dynamic light scattering sometimes quasi-elastic light scattering. So it's not elastic-elastic. Lambda is not perfectly the same, but it's quasi-elastic. So if you see that in books, don't get scared. That's what it means. So quasi-elastic. But since we're talking about the Doppler shift, this gives you, you can flip it and actually conclude that you, using Doppler shift, you are able to do very, very accurate measurement of frequencies. 10 to the 8 times less than the optical frequency. Okay, so think about that. It's, it's not very often that we're able to do parts per billion measurement, right, in anything in the lab, is very hard. But with light, it's actually very easy. So if you take an interferometer and you reflect the light off, I have this plane wave incident and I have a mirror. And I move the mirror by a velocity v. And for best results, probably what I want to do is to interfere the light from this moving mirror with the light that doesn't move. And I put them both together here. And actually, if you write the intensity with the, uh, the formula that we used before in interferometry, you get the intensity of one, intensity of the other one, as usual, two times the square root of intensity one, intensity two. And now look at this. <coughs> you get the cosine of Two k naught v t, where this is the Doppler shift. So what it means is that I am very sensitive to these velocities. I can move the mirror at ten microns per second, and I will get the frequency shift that is probably 10 to the 15 or more of the speed of light. 10 to the 15 below the speed of light. And I will be able to make that measurement. Isn't that crazy? It's very interesting. For example, you measure in a cell. We do that, for example. You can measure a particle traveling along an axon or something like that. That is moving at half a micron a second. And the measurement is actually rooted in some kind of a Doppler shift. Okay? So why is this measurement so powerful? It's always because you're mixing two fields. So it's a relative measurement. Okay? So we say sometimes that these two fields are beating. So you remove that common, the speed of light goes away. It, you're looking only at the differences between one with respect to the other. So basically, if my mirror is moving like this, <coughs> and I plot the intensity, I'm going to get a sinusoid that perfectly will inform me about the velocity. With very, very high accuracy. Many orders of magnitude below the actual speed of light, which is remarkable. OK, so dynamic light scattering is basically <clears throat> measuring the contributions of these Doppler shifts from all these particles. And think about this. Now that we know the Doppler shift is dependent on direction, what does that tell us about 
the Doppler shift I'm going to measure far away from this entire suspension of particles. Am I going to get one frequency shift? No, right? I will get a distribution of frequency shifts, which is the equivalent of Doppler broadening in lasers for you, the laser experts in the room, who works with Gary Eden. There we go. It's the equivalent of Doppler broadening in a gas laser, where you have the molecules, right, with Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution, many different velocities, it will give you many di different frequencies. So, the same thing here, on average they move with the same velocity because, with the same speed, because they are in the same suspension, everything is homogeneous, the size is the same, but the directions are varying all the time. Okay? So, basically, the information about the size of the particle will be carried in that distribution of Doppler broadening, that spectrum. So, intuitively, without calculating anything, what do we expect? If I put, there are two things that, two classes of applications, as I, as I mentioned. One, I put small particles in water, big particles in water. I do this experiment. Which one is going to give me more higher frequency shifts? Small. small ones. Why? Because the small ones, we assume Brownian motion, we assume diffusion, right? The smaller ones move faster. <coughs> so they will give me higher frequencies. Now, the other type of application, same particles, I put them once in water and once in honey or oil, right? Which one is going to give me broader frequency distribution? The ones in water, right, in the less viscous. Okay, th this is the idea. The rest is just math, okay? So, the difference with respect to what we've done so far is in the coordinates of each particle, m, being time dependent. You can think of it as a very generalized Young interferometer, right? The one with the two slits. So now instead of two slits, you have a million slits. And not only that, the slits are doing this. <laughs> right? It's exactly the same problem. So you have an interference of light coming from all these particles, interfering at that one point, but now the phase shifts are actually continuously changing, fluctuating. Yeah? Just to clarify, the, uh, the Doppler shift is not predicted. It's just the fact because the particle is going to a higher orbital and then it has some relaxation time. No, uh, say that again. It's not predicted by wave optics, basically. It's not just the refractive index. It's the fact that the the particle takes some time to release a photon. Or is that am I getting that wrong? Like, why do we have Doppler in the first place? Oh, okay. I don't know, but I don't want to talk about photons, to be honest with you. But but uh, it's because you have two systems of reference, okay? So the interaction, okay, let, let's talk about waves. So you have waves interacting with the charge in the particle. So the charge is doing its usual things, whatever the orbitals are doing. But now on top of that, you have a direction of velocity. So when you write that interaction potential between the two or the induced polarization, you will have a, in a way, a drift in that charge. That will give you a constant. Now you can think of dwell time of the photon in the particle. Feel free. But, yeah? It's, it's just not, it's not fully <coughs> a wave optics thing. It also incorporates quantum optics. Right? I don't think so. No. Okay. I don't think you need quantum optics to understand this. Um, so think of the charge, the electronic charge. So on top of the, flux, the, in, the induced polarization, the interaction between your field and the charge, right? And now on top of that charge, you have a drift. So a global velocity that you attach to that. That's it. Um, so notice, we're doing the exact same thing we've done before. We have the um, scattering potential. That is now dependent on time. And again, we're using the same idea that you have the scattering potential of one particle convolved with the distribution of delta functions, which give us the position of each particle. 
And the difference is now that this rj is a function of time. Everything else is the same. OK? Uh, OK. So in the Q domain, so we take the spatial Fourier transform and we end up with the scattering complex field as a function of Q, which is the momentum transfer. It looks exactly like before. You remember what this was called? Structure function, or factor. To me, it's a function. Uh, again, the difference is that these are J. These are Js are moving. So it's not a fixed phase that each pair of particles gives you, or each particle gives you a phase shift, right? That's, that's the structure function. It's adding all these phase shifts from individual particles, okay? Taking into account those delays. But now these things are jittering, right? So those delays are moving in time. So by the way, what's going to happen with your interference? So first of all, imagine I have the distribution of particles. I freeze them. I freeze the water, OK? What do I get? I get some kind of messy interference diffraction pattern, scattering pattern, right? But fixed. Yeah? So I measure phase and amplitude of that. I know how to retrieve the three-dimensional structure. That's what, what we studied last time. Now I let the water melt. How is the pattern going to look like, the scatter pattern? It's going to fluctuate. Right? So our goal is to understand those fluctuations somehow, quantify those fluctuations. Basically, we're going to do a temporal autocorrelation function of that field. And then connect that with the distribution of velocities. That's all we're doing. OK? So again, the key is in this term, not so much in this term, because this is fixed. Right? This is a form function. This is the scattering from one particle as if it's by itself in the universe. That's fixed. Nothing dynamic about that. Although, there are interesting situations when the particle itself is squashy. OK, so you can have, actually, that, those are very important problems. Like, how do you deal with these bubbles that are also suspended? So they move. Their center of mass moves, but they are also changing shapes. <coughs> in that case, you will have a T in here, too. Okay? We're not going to worry about that now. OK. <coughs> this is a random quantity. If the particles are in suspension in a liquid, entirely um, viscous fluid, so you know the difference between a liquid and a fluid in general? So, so fluid is more general than liquid. Fluid has viscosity, which we call, let's say, a response function that has an imaginary part. The imaginary part of a response function usually is related to loss. right? So in refractive index, the imaginary part of the refractive index gives us absorption. So it's dissipation. <laughs> and elasticity, the real part, this is something to do, for example, with having these molecules, these polymers that are able to store energy. Okay, So there is no dissipation. They store, and then they release. The equivalent of our refractive index. So send light through that, that pure dielectric. So this will be a dielectric. This will be a metal, right? High conductivity, high loss, low conductivity, High refractive index. So in a refractive index, we we'll, we'll go back to your interaction dwell time. So there is temporarily you can store energy in that material, but then you release without loss. So when elasticity is zero, then you get pure viscosity, you get a liquid. That's what we call a liquid. So water is pretty close to that. Yeah? So if my particles are in water, in a viscous, purely viscous fluid, there is no way of predicting the next step that the particle is going to take. Think about that for a second. So this is the Brownian motion discovered in the 1820s by Brown. 
And then it took us 80 years to understand, to write an equation for it, and that's one of the most cited papers by Einstein. Yeah? So it's very interesting. If you have no elasticity, and you know the coordinates, let's say, r at the particular point t, there is no way to predict the next step, which will be r at t plus tau. That's what we mean by random. Taking a measurement at all previous times does not help you predicting what's going to happen next. The probability for the particle to go in any direction is equal. Okay? But the moment we add elasticity, what do you think happens? There is some memory effect. So that makes the problem very interesting. So the moment you add some way of storage, now you have, imagine, like microscopic little springs. Okay? You compress, let's say, a little spring, it's going to release along, probably along the same direction. Right? So you start to add correlation. So you have a random diffusion, and on top of it, you will have some deterministic, some predict ability, some uh, predictable behavior. Okay? So, for pure diffusion, so in other words, in liquids we have pure diffusion. In polymers like shampoo or cytoskeleton of a cell, it's a combination of diffusion and elasticity or predictable motion. Okay. So we're going to treat this as purely diffusive for now. And the way we're going to quantify the fluctuations, or trying to analyze the fluctuations, is by doing a temporal correlation function. So you know this, that if you have a random process or a random variable, such as the coordinates of these particles, Rj's, if the system is stationary, okay, meaning the, the system is random, but its averages are deterministic, among other things, it means that your correlation function is a deterministic function. For example, this light is random. You, I cannot predict, measuring here the field of this white light, I cannot predict what's going to happen next only within very, very short times. But in general, I cannot predict it. But the spectrum of this light is deterministic. You measure it once, maybe it looks like a Gaussian. I don't know. But that stays the same. Fourier transform of that it will be an autocorrelation function. That is deterministic, too. So that's why we use autocorrelation functions uh, for understanding stationary systems. So the way we do it is, by definition, we take the average of f at, at t. Keep in mind, it depends on q as well. So this means that I can do a measurement. This is the incident. I can do a measure, measurement at a particular angle theta, which is in q. It's captured in q. And now I'm doing a correlation between the field at the particular time t and at t plus tau, and the average in time. So this is just the definition of the autocorrelation function. So because these two factors has one that is constant in time, so this basically give me, gives me an intensity that is fixed. And the important thing is taking the, uns or the ensemble or the temporal average of this dynamic structure function. That's another name for it. This is dy dynamic structure function. What's the meaning of this? If I go in the lab and I do this measurement, and I do this temporal autocorrelation function, let's say, I'm gonna, it's going to give me this term in front. What does that mean? Scattering cross-section from a single particle, okay, differential, right, because it depends on Q, good. 
But from a practical point of view, what does uh, what does that what do you think it means? How is it going to look? Size? Is it related to the size of the particle, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So this is the solution for the single par particles that we calculated before, right? But from an experimental point of view, it means that if you were to plot this versus Q, do you remember how it looks like? It always looks like this. OK, so intensity is going to be like that. So this will be magnitude square of F naught of Q versus Q. And basically, this is scattering angle, this Q, right? So it means that if I, as I scan my angles in both directions, maybe, I can get maxima and minima, maxima and minima. And obviously, one lesson is that you don't want to be in here, probably. That wouldn't be a good angle to measure, right? So that's just practical. So you want to avoid the. the if, if your particles are single size, you get actually zeros in intensity. You get dark, dark as you move. Okay, so there's nothing to measure in that part. You want to stay away from that. Okay, so basically this is an envelope of my single that is, uh, of my signal that is static. Uh, other than falling in a dark place, we don't care about that much. How do we deal with this? That is our main problem. First of all, this is called the first order or field correlation function. As opposed to an intensity autocorrelation function, which we call a second order. It's a little bit of a confusing first and second order definition, but why do we need to introduce an intensity correlation function is because, again, we don't have access to fields experimentally to do temporal correlations of the fields themselves. My detector only measures intensities. So I can think of a way to measure this field correlation function directly, and actually we do that in our lab, but it's not standard. The way to do it is to use interferometry, so you need to Take the scatter field from the object and then add the reference field. And that gives you the phase information. Only then do you get a field autocorrelation function. If you just put a detector somewhere there at a particular scattering angle, you will get fluctuations, but they're all in intensity. OK, so next what we're going to look at is to connect the intensity fluctuations to the field, to the field fluctuations. The second order correlation, intensity, intensity correlation function to the field, field correlation function. Okay? And the reason we do that, again, is because we have access to intensities experimentally, not so much to fields. So most commercial instruments use just detectors, intensity measurements. Is that okay? All right. Okay, there will be some assumptions. Um, when we average these fluctuations, because uh, because essentially there are too many terms in here that do not contribute. So our, our double summation here takes into account um, if you like, pairs of particles, M and N, and summing all over them. And we are going to say that particle M and particle N do not influence each other, which is a very reasonable assumption, except for some particular situations, right? So we are going to say that the coordinate of particle M and coordinate of particle N, they are independent of one another. There is no correlation between them. So essentially what we do, we get rid of the off-diagonal terms, M and M. We're only going to keep the coordinates of the same particle, M. Okay? This is very uh, a kind of a traditional way, a traditional assumption that makes a lot of sense. Now, what are the exceptions, do you think? Huh? Charged particles. So what happens when we have charged particles? 
Okay, so they have to be charged, but also close to one another. Okay, so now, even if they are not charged, <coughs> but you pack them close, they start to interact. So not through charge, but they interact through, what do you think happens? Huh? Collision is one, yeah, so if you really pack them, so they start bouncing into one another, obviously they are going to affect each other. But there is another more subtle effect. Huh? Wonder walls, I think, doesn't play a major role in this particular case. But when the particle is moving, it's creating actually a current in the liquid. Right? I mean, clearly, I'm displacing liquid on the one side, and the, the liquid has to flow to fill the space. And it's going to take this particle and drag it in. If you ever watch Formula One, <laughs> they use that all the time to pass opponents. So they get close to the, <laughs> to the car in front of them, and they get sucked into the current, so they get the boost in the speed without consuming any of their energy, just using the opponent. Or if you're reckless, like I was in high school, if you go, if you bike in, in the back of a high-speed bus or something, you go 60 miles an hour without putting any effort. In. It's for the same reason that you're sucked into that. What is that called? A wake? Is that a wake? What is this called? When a boat goes in the water and wake? Okay. So you see, that is. Um, it's all to do with the interparticle distance. So once you make that very, very small, roughly comparable to their size, this assumption will not work. Okay? So for example, <clears throat> when you have colloids, it's all kinds of interesting problems. I'm sorry I'm digressing so much, but I think these are interesting. If you take Brownian uh, distribution particles and you let it in your office for like a month, something crazy happens. They start to settle down, and if the particles are charged, they settle down, but only to a point of equilibrium where they suspend, and they're kind of repelling each other just enough so they're floating there. And if you wait long enough, they're actually falling into a crystal structure. If you wait long enough, you get the colloidal crystal, a crystal made of these particles. And if you look around it, you start seeing colors meaning it starts to act like a perfect grating. Okay, so you start with a mess that looks like a milk, looks like nothing. You wait for it, to, for the gravity to take its, do its job, and they settle to a position of equilibrium that actually becomes a crystal. Because it's minimizing, the system is minimizing energy. And it's interesting that it actually becomes a perfect crystal if everything is pure in there. And there's, this is very kind of uh, interesting research area because it gives you a model that you can see. You're, stu you're studying crystallography, if you want, with a model that you can actually see with your eyes, I mean, with your microscope. Right? So you have one micron particle settling with different symmetries. You have dislocations in these crystals, but you see them with your eye. So that's kind of cool. OK? So clearly, in that case, this assumption will fall apart. And people study how the crystal is actually melting. So we call that the glass transition from a crystal to a glass, from an ordered structure to a disordered structure. Right? So it's, it's all very interesting. OK. So if we assume that the coordinates between different particles are uh, not correlated, then all the off-diagonal terms disappear. So we are, left on, we are left only with the diagonal terms. Okay, So correlation between positions of the same particle. Now, um, basically, what we're going to do here is to go from a we're going to use the ergodicity assumption which I'm sure you know what it is. Do you know what it is? You know what it is. No, Alex. 
Never heard of it. Really? It comes from, how many people have heard of ergodic system? Maybe my spelling is not. Ergodicity? Oh, from my class? Yeah. Really? I mean, yeah. <laughs> are you serious? I mean, I have to look it up. How many of you took thermodynamics? Like, You're doing in high school a little bit of thermodynamics, right? No? Nothing? But you don't know KT in high school? You don't know what that is? Uh, not, not until college. Yeah. Okay, but I'm sorry. What happened to the Chinese people in the room here? Did you learn about KT in high school? No? No? That's globalization for you right there. <laughs> All right, never mind. It's not, it, I mean, it's interesting. It, it was introduced in thermodynamics and, uh, by Gibbs. Uh, so the problem was very simple. If, if I'm trying to understand the collective behavior of these molecules in the room, for example, right? I end up, I can write the equations of motion for all the molecules, but I end up with 10 to the, I don't know, 23 molecules, each with going in three dimensions. So you end up with an enormous uh, number of equations that is not really, is not tractable. So in the end, what we want to do is to average the behavior of these molecules, and you get macroscopic quantities like pressure, temperature, things like this that make no sense at the single molecule level, but they only collectively can be defined. So you need to do an average like this. So what Gibbs said is that if I take a random system like this, a temporal average, in other words, waiting for that system to show me all its possible configurations, right? So in our case, it will be the coordinate of the Brownian motion, uh, let's say, along x. So it will be a random function like this. Yeah? Waiting for that particle to show me all its possible configurations is the same as doing an ensemble average, meaning averaging over all the entire particles, or computing all the possible configurations to begin with. So in other words, what Gibbs did, he took, it was much easier to calculate all the possible configurations of these molecules in space, and then assume that if I wait long enough, I will see all of them. Okay, there are exceptions to ergodicity. There are systems that are clearly not ergodic. Okay, but a suspension of particles on the Brownian motion, they are perfectly ergodic systems. Okay, so basically we're talking about ensemble averaging as opposed to temporal averaging. So how do we do an ensemble average? Okay, well, we have to introduce something about the physics of the motion. So if, if you tell me uh, the particles are on the Brownian motion, I can use that, okay? That will give me a certain distribution of probability density of finding the particle at particular coordinates. So that will allow me to do the ensemble average, and using ergodicity, that will give me the temporal correlation function. Are you with me? So that's what we do. Uh, so this will be my ensemble average. The average of e, e q r of t is the integral of psi. Okay, so this will be the probability to find the particles in the vicinity of r, vicinity of t multiplied with the function I'm averaging and integrating over space. Yeah? That's the definition of an average, where this is a probability density. Are you with me? Okay, so this is the, what you had in the homework. X, integral of X, P of X, DX, right? When we show that the average of a convolution using the convolution is the sum of the two averages, right? It's the same thing, except the quantity I'm averaging is this complex exponential. 
And the funny thing is, when you're averaging complex exponentials, this average integral looks like a Fourier transform. And in fact, this thing has a name, so what you get out is actually psi of q. It's a Fourier transform psi. And this is called the characteristic function of a random characteristic okay, function of a random process. Okay, so basically all I need to do is to find this probability and I'm done because I assume ergodicity. I assume that doing this ensemble averaging using this probability will be identical to waiting long enough and looking at all those particles and averaging them in time. Yeah? That was Gibbs' idea. Or Gibbs's idea. So, okay, notice I, I skipped over this. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to that, to the intensity correlation. I think it flows better if we go to... So now let's get to the physics of it. So what do I know? I know that the particles are under Brownian motion, and mm -hmm. therefore the diffusion equation applies. It's a very simple diffusion equation. Remember, we talked about it last time in the context of photons or wave, waves diffusing in the tissue. That's OK, too. It's much easier because the diffusion coefficient is constant. Particles are of the same size. The water is the same everywhere. It's homogeneous. So it looks like this. So remember, the difference with respect to the wave equation is that this is only first order derivative. Okay? But that is the same. So basically, this is the, the equation that um, defines how my particles are moving. And this is actually the, directly in the probability density. So this equation is with respect to the probability of finding this particle in the vicinity of R and the vicinity of moment T. Okay? Which, if you think about it, it looks like a energy density as well. If you drop a droplet of ink and you watch it over time, it's going to be a cloud. The density, if you plot that density of that cloud of particles, of ink particles, that is exactly, up to a normalization constant, that is exactly a probability to find a particle at a particular distance r. Yeah? Huh? Nod if it's okay. Do this if it's not. Don't do anything if you don't care, which is, seems to be the <laughs> preferred response. Is this okay? All right. So, again, the process is like this. I need to do that integral of the, the complex term that keeps track of the phases, right? So I'm trying to keep track of all these positions of the particles and average them. Because that will give me a temporal autocorrelation function, okay? So that is hard, but if I use ergodicity, I can commute this time average to an ensemble average. So for that, now I need the probability density associated with this random process. But luckily, I know the equation that governs this. All I need to do is to get my psi as a function of q, because of what, because of what we just wrote earlier, right here, and I will be done. Okay? If you take that equation and you do the Fourier transform, what you get out is exactly this. Fourier transform with respect to R. We used this many times already. What's the Fourier transform of this Laplacian? Hmm? Fourier transform of a Laplacian operator. Huh? Okay, we call it Q here, but yeah. So it's I. My, it's I Q times I Q, right? So it's twice. Minus Q squared. Boom. So notice, I have an equation, first order differential equation in time, psi tilde here, psi tilde on the right. If I move 
as usual, you move tilde here, you get this psi over psi <coughs> equals dq squared dt. Therefore, psi is an exponential function that looks like, like this. Is that cool or what? If you take the original or the classical book on dynamic light scattering, you will find a much windier derivation, in my opinion. Oh, it takes 15 pages. OK? But using our Fourier transform operations and properties, we can get to this very, very fast. So here's what we did. Again, I'm trying to average this thing. And this is the probability density times the quantity I'm trying to average, which is this, average, uh, yeah, average over space. This is exactly a Fourier transform. It's going to give me a probability density, but now it's Fourier transform in terms of spatial frequencies. How do I get to that? Well, I'm using the fact that the probability density psi of r is governed by the diffusion equation. Since I need it in the Q domain, I might as well take the Fourier transform of that. Once you did that, it immediately becomes clear that this psi is an exponential decay in time with the D and Q dependence. Meaning, this thing looks like e to the minus T over tau naught where tau naught is 1 over dq squared. So basically, this is all I needed to get my autocorrelation function. My field autocorrelation function, measuring the field of a particular angle associated with q, of a, at a particular q, I measure those fluctuations, I do a field-field correlation function, the way that thing looks is exactly like that. So if my measurement is right, I plot the autocorrelation function, I'm going to get an exponential. So this will be my g1 with respect to tau. So this is a delay. It's going to look like an exponential. 1 over e is going to give me tau naught. So I measure this. Once you measure this, I know that tau naught is nothing more but 1 over d q squared. I know my q because I picked it. I did the measurement over this particular angle. My q is fixed. Therefore, I can get d. And if I got d, then pretty much I'm done because d has radius. This is the diffusion coefficient depends on the radius of the particle, viscosity, and temperature. Is that cool or what? You're able to size particles without touching them, without imaging them. Just send light, measure here, get their fluctuations, autocorrelation, and you get it out. Let's see if it makes sense. So if I increase the temperature, my D goes up, right? Increase the temperature, the particles get more agitated. That makes sense. I increase the viscosity, the diffusion goes down. That makes sense. I reduce the particle size, diffusion goes up. That makes sense, too. Now let's look at our measurement. If I measure a short correlation time. My D is big, which means my particle is small. So tau is 1 over Q squared. And what's the inverse of D? So KBT was at the top, and this is 6 pi eta A. So tau is proportional to particle size. The shorter the particle, the smaller the particle, the faster the dynamics, the shorter the correlation time. Makes sense, right? 
Uh, same thing for viscosity. If I increase the viscosity, particles are sluggish, dynamics is slow, tau naught gets bigger. Okay, so that also makes sense. Is that cool? Here's another interesting thing. What do you make of this dependence on Q? Q is 2 pi with a 2 in front over lambda, sine of theta over 2, everything squared. So this is basically theta squared, roughly. What do you make of this dependence? <clears throat> what happens if I increase my angle? I'm increasing my scattering angle and I'm measuring the exact same thing. So, this is proportional with 1 over theta squared for small angles. Just bear with me for the sake of argument. I'm increasing tau theta. What happens? Huh? Tau gets shorter. What? What's the meaning of that? Think about this. And it depends on theta squared. It's a pretty strong dependence. Is that useful, do you think? Could be, right? When? So now I, let's think the other way. I bring theta close to zero. My tau goes. Exactly. I have a knob that I can tune. Usually we are equipped with some kind of detector that goes only this fast, right? We're limited in the frequencies we can measure. We're limited by noise at the low frequencies, right? So this knob allows us to do things like this. For example, I'm looking at a very sluggish phenomenon. So, I don't know, particles in very viscous stuff. Glycerol has viscosity a thousand times water, that, that of water, okay? So put particles in glycerol, they are like, uh, the sl what's the name of the animals from the new movie? Sloth. 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 That was awesome. Did you see the movie? You should go see the... <coughs> um, so at the DMV, <laughs> the DMV, one of the slots is the clerk at the DMV office. <laughs> so you can imagine. Uh, go see the movie. Uh, yeah, so this is a very slow process. Your detector is going to be filled up with noise at those frequencies, right? But now, if I'm switching my angle to very high values, it looks to me, the same process, looks to me as if it's faster. And the opposite is true. I have very tiny particles, very fast. They're beyond my frequencies that I can measure with my detector. I'm closing down my scattering angle, and I'm bringing them into my measurement range. Very useful. Um, OK. Why is that? Why is it that theta is important? What's the, do you have an intuition for that? Why is tau changing with theta? Well, basically, theta naught is the time it takes, on average, for the particle to move a distance 2 pi over q. So, in a way, 
tau naught is this decoherence time, if you like. It's the time it takes to lose coherence, lose correlation, right? And that happens when you basically travel over more than one wavelength. Okay? So do you remember um, this picture when I have K incident and K scattered as usual and I have my Q? Do you remember what this Q was related to? It was related to a sinusoid that was developing along the direction of Q whose period was proportional to 1 over Q, was exactly 2 pi over Q. Right? So when I'm doing my measurement at this particular theta, essentially I'm looking at, at this sinusoid actually jittering, doing this. So the moment, on average, this distance became equal to the period, that's when you, by kind of by convention, we assume that's when the signal got decorrelated. That precisely amounts to tau naught. So that's why it makes sense now when I make a large angle of scattering like this, my Q is bigger, this is going to be much finer, the period is much shorter, it takes shorter time to make that distance for the particle. Right? And what is the, the other limit? When I close down my theta, right, I make them almost perfectly parallel, like that. I'll have a Q that is very, very tiny. The sinusoid will be big. It takes a long time for the particles to travel such a big sinusoid, to the point where when I overlap them perfectly, if I measure in the forward direction, I get no information about dynamics. This period becomes infinite. As usual, I'm measuring the DC, the DC component of my scattered signal. It only gives me global measurement. It gives me something about the volume of the whole scattering medium. Nothing to do with the structure whether it's static or, dy or dynamic, right? We already saw that. Still useful because the forward scattering gives you the volume of the particles, right? Remember that discussion. But it will not inform us on the dynamics at all. Okay. Before we make the correlation, the, the, uh, um, the connection to the intensity correlation function, I want to ask you one more thing. What's the smallest size that we can measure? Half a wavelength. Half a wavelength? Everybody agrees? So we set the resolution limit for the microscope. That was the order of lambda over 2. Right, or lambda over 2NA. Do we have the same limit here? Q has a 2K range. Q has a maximum. What's the formula that gives me the size? Let me spell it out for you. So I have tau naught equals this thing. So I have A equals uh, KBT divided by 6 pi eta Q squared times tau naught. What's the size limit? Time resolution. Yes, is not lambda over two. 
we can measure with this thing one nanometer particle. No problem. Why? Why can I measure, why can I size one nanometer particles with dynamic light scattering? But when it comes to imaging, I can't. It's not an easy question. What do you think? Well, in the microscope, the resolution is given by what? Hmm? Yeah, by how much scattering I collect from the object. So now mathematically, the range of Q, not just one fixed Q, the range of Q. If I only pick one angle, right, one very high angle of scattering, that will not give me a resolution. It's going to give me one sinusoid. That will be a terrible resolution. It's going to be just one frequency. The resolution is the coverage from zero to Q max. That's the resolution, that bandwidth. Here, I have no such thing. The information is encoded in tau, in the time domain, not in Q, not in angles. Angles matter, but they only shift my tau up and down. They only scale. It's a scaling parameter. The information is not encoded in the angles. It's encoded in the temporal fluctuations. So that's why your answer is very good. It, my resolution in sizing the particles is actually how fast I can measure, right? So as I make the particles very, very small, they're a lot more dynamic, which actually means that I need to measure fast. So the next question is, can I call this resolution? So no problem having a one nanometer. I mean, I wouldn't say no problem. It's challenging to measure, but it's doable. In other words, why can't I use this as a resolution? Why can't I break the diffraction limit using dynamic light scattering? Or can I? What's the difference? Is this the dynamic radius? Okay, yes. I don't want to get into that, but yes, it's a hydrodynamic radius that we measure. But that, if the, spheric, the particle is spherical, probably we don't care. The fundamental difference is this. In microscopy, the resolution is defined as what's the smallest difference, distance between two points that I can resolve. Remember that? So I consider these parts resolved if blah, blah, blah. I come up with a convention, Rayleigh criterion or something like that. In dynamic light scattering, we cannot resolve, we cannot tell where the particles are at all. We give all that information away, in fact. We have zero spatial resolution. We average over the entire ensemble of particles. We give that up, up front. Where's my figure? Right here. The information is spatially average over the entire volume of the particles. We are sizing the particles. We're getting one average number out for the entire ensemble. Huge difference. In microscopy, that is true resolution. This is not resolution. This is sensitivity, if you want to call it, to size. But we have zero resolution. We don't know where it is. Why? Because my Q is fixed, basically. So how can you have special resolution when you only measure one frequency? You can't. But encoding that size information in the time domain is actually, turns out to be very, very sensitive to uh, particle size. 
Yeah? Are we clear on that distinction? So, no numerical aperture limit for the sizing in a dynamic light scattering instrument, which is, may appear as being surprising, but really is not. Okay, so finally, we need to make this connection with, with the intensity, intensity correlation function. Where is it? Here. So far, we talked about field-field correlation factor, what we call first order correlation function, G1. But as I said, unless you do interferometry, which is not very common, you measure intensity fluctuations. <coughs> so it turns out that there's a connection we can make between intensity fluctuations, intensity correlation function, and field correlation function. And here's how it goes. So the correlation in intensity, it is clear that the intensity fluctuates at a particular Q, right? Because you get these particles, they send light, we add all that light together, and the phases are changing. So the interference pattern is changing, and you get fluctuations at each Q. The autocorrelation function in terms of intensity is exactly like this. Each intensity is nothing more but uh, basically U times U conjugate. Okay? You plug all that, that in, and you get now fourth order summations. So we went from field correlation that gave you only a double summation to a quadruple summation. So now we're going to do those assumptions that we did before. That if the particles are all the same, that gives you an average intensity. If the pairs are the same, they give you summations of field-field correlation functions. Right? So each term here gives you an autocorrelation G1, the exact same way we uh, defined it previously. And if the field, if, if the, flag, the system is stationary, G1 is the same everywhere. Right? So the particles are identical, the viscosity is the same everywhere, G1 is the same everywhere. Okay, so at the end of the day, once you put all these together, so the first terms, the diagonal terms gives you the intensity, the off diagonal, the two by two pairs, gives you these correlation functions. And all the others give you nothing. We neglect all that are all different. Okay? The only ones that survive are these pairs, two pairs. So at the end of the day, we have to get intensity squared average, intensity squared average times G1. And you normalize it by intensity squared. And this should be G. And at the end of the day, you get this. So what does that mean? If I do an intensity, intensity correlation function, G2, and I plot it versus tau, I have a DC, baseline, and on top of it I have G1, which is exponential, like that. That's two. So this is measurable, the good thing is. That's why we did all this. G2 is measurable directly. You just put the detector there, you measure the intensity, and then numerically do the autocorrelation function. That's what you get. The problem is my D relates to G1, as we just showed earlier, right? So what do I need to do? I need to subtract that background. And it turns out this is easier said than done. Why? Because this background, to measure it experimentally, you really have to wait a long time. So in fact, a, a nice trick that the companies came up with, uh, so these commercial instruments have, uh, have linear sampling in time for a while, close to the origin, and then logarithmic sampling at the tails. So they throw some very long time measurements just to give you where this baseline is. So you'll get the measurement here, here, here. So you feed that, you know your background. Once you subtracted that, you end up with G1, and you're done. 
Okay? So this background thing is more of a practical issue. But the idea is that now G2, by the way, this has a name. It's called the Ziegert relation. Connection between the intensity correlation and field correlation. And basically, at the end of the day, what you have is this. I measure this. I subtract the background. I end up with an exponential that has D in it. And that's it. Okay? Let's see if we miss anything else. I can do the same measurement with the power spectrum, or I can represent it. I can take the same data, either show the correlation decay or its power spectrum. It's nothing more but the Fourier transform. They are Fourier transform one another. What's the Fourier transform of an exponential? Oh, Lorentzian. Lorentzian. This is a Lorentzian. Now, delta omega is nothing more but one over tau naught. And delta omega is proportional to dq squared. <clears throat> That's it. What's your rule of thumb? When do I look at total correlation? When do I look at power spectrum? So if you're an experimentalist and you try to do a fit, in the end what you do is you plot a graph, you fit it with this model, and the fitting parameter comes out. D equals blah, blah, blah. So I'm faced with two options. Let's say my autocorrelation function is very narrow. Looks like that. This will be G1. And I know if I take the free transform of this, I get something very fat. G1 of omega. Which one do you fit? In an ideal world, they all should give you the same thing. It's the exact same information, one versus the other. But the rule of thumb is, is to always work with the representation that gives you a flatter signal. Right? Less dynamic range. This has a very fast decay. You are fitting three points here, or four. Right? Well, this will give you a lot more details. Okay, so it's much, you probably will have more precision. This, of course, it, it gives you identical results if there is no noise. I'm talking about the real situation when on top of this you'll get some noise. The flatter one will always give you more precise measurement or better fits. Okay? I'll see you. Tuesday. Enjoy your homework. It's a lot of fun. So there are particles on a cube that are vibrating like this. And you'll be able to measure the scatter field, to calculate the scatter field.